you, Deputy Chair, I rise this evening to speak to the budget handed down last week and provide my response. Uh, and in doing so, in the short 10 weeks that I've been in this place, uh, I provide some context around my commentary in terms of the uh, outcomes that I seek to uh, ensure occur for our not only Tasmanian community, particularly our northern Tasmanian community and the people of Bass, uh, the community that elected me to be here, uh, and that in being here and finding myself on this side of the house, determined to support me to ensure that I do my very best to keep the government to account. That, in fact, is our role, and in the last 10 weeks, I've done my best to stand up to that. In reviewing the first uh, budget to this level of scrutiny uh, since my time here, I wanted to put it through the lens of the things that are important to me. And uh, my why, my purpose, is about my kids. It's about the kids of Tasmania and their future. And what do we do now to incrementally improve the opportunities in Tasmania to ensure that they can have a future where they can believe in possibilities, where they can dream of opportunity, and that they can feel confident that making Tasmania their home, that they have a way to participate, a way to contribute, and that they too could be leaders of the future. One of the things that uh, brings me to action more deeply than anything else is when I see injustice. And if I see injustice, I want to make sure that whatever barriers in the place of improving opportunities for people, that we set to break down those barriers that have been often set by the status quo. In doing that, the community expect us as leaders to be brave, bold, uh, have courage to stand up and identify things that aren't right, that aren't OK and that could be done better. And that's the lens that I've taken to reviewing the budget for this year. But in doing so, making sure that our commentary is always fair, uh, that where things are good, that it's acknowledged, but where things could be better, Perhaps a commentary is provided, but perhaps an offer of being able to uh, join with others to provide a strong opportunity is possible. I remember on the day that I was sworn in, there was a service early in the morning and uh, I spoke into my inaugural speech a quote from the bishop uh, of the early morning service of that day. And he, in fact, said, it's not particularly profound to suggest that we could not solve a lot of these problems without pretending that one party or another has a monopoly on the solutions. And he went on to say, in order that we can solve the critical solutions that are happening in Tasmania right now, he went on to say, we need to bring our best selves, we need to bring all of our best selves, all of our collective wisdom and energy in our minds from both sides of parliament so we can tackle these issues together. So the lens that I bring uh, following these last 10 weeks is to ensure that uh, things that can be done better are highlighted, but things that are done well are acknowledged. I love Tasmania, and uh, I seek to serve to both protect all that is good, but actually to support and raise up all those that struggle or that are perhaps not doing as well as they could do in this great place. And that will be individuals, families, communities. It'll be in industry and business. And in the 10 weeks that I've been here, I've made it a commitment to go out and talk to many people in our community. And that, again, provides the filter, the lens across which I look at this budget. The last couple of weeks, and this again is another lens that I look at the budget through, have been disappointing for me. It's been disappointing where I've trusted that when a government says they're seeking to provide clarity, confidence, um, when they're seeking to make commitments to people in our community, that I'm concerned that when perhaps something doesn't go right or something could be done better, there's not an ability or a willingness to acknowledge that and do better or to correct things that have not gone so well. And so that makes me worry about commitments in the budget now, which perhaps may not come to fruition, that grand plans that are presented and launched may not in fact be delivered. So again, the, um, the filtering of my commentary is with that in mind. I want to start uh, with comments around Bass and then move into my shadow portfolio areas. Um, 
many people in our community, and, and I'm concerned uh, around the level of commentary that happens around various people in our community, but many in our community that are doing it tough right now have perhaps never been in that situation before. There are many people in our community who perhaps have never had had the worry of how will I make the rent this week? How will I pay the mortgage payment? How will I put food on the table? There are people that I've had conversations with in the last few weeks and months that are sharing with me that they're making choices as parents right now to not eat so they can feed their children. And when you hear across the chamber that, you know, does the opposition simply want to um, pay for everybody, I think it really disregards the reality of the broad spread and diverse hurts that are being felt across our community right now, across all sectors. And I acknowledge the previous speaker, Mr Tucker, member for Lyons, uh, who says that, for instance, the ag culture is, ag agriculture sector is doing really well right now. And I want to acknowledge right now that there are many in our community that are doing extraordinarily well, and that should be celebrated, that should be acknowledged. However, at the same time, there are many in my primary industries folio, particularly, say, in fisheries, where there's a real struggle uh, and, and perhaps in a way that they've not felt before. So I think it's important that we're sensitive um, and we bring empathy to the comments that we make in regards to the communities that we need to stand up and support right now. So in Bass, whether it be a young person, whether it be a family that's experienced hard times, often close to breaking point, I think we need to be really careful about our commentary. There are um, strong initiatives in the budget uh, that I'm hopeful are delivered that will go some way towards supporting these members of our community. And I want to acknowledge the contributions that are being made to the Neighbourhood House Network across Tasmania. It's, there's no doubt that the neighbourhood houses, the men's sheds, the community organisations are being overrun at the moment with more members, more people in their community coming for greater support, whether it be the freezer fillers that they're creating through volunteers in their community, whether it be the um, food boxes or food parcels that are provided. Um, so I want to acknowledge... Uh, in recognition of the challenging times, the contributions made to neighbourhood house networks, uh, the men's sheds and other organisations that are providing those environments for people in our community to often all that is needed, and it's not all just about providing funds to support people in need, but often all is needed is a conversation, somewhere that you can have um, an open conversation with someone and be brave enough to share your challenges so that perhaps a suggestion of a service or a suggestion of a different way could be made right now to, in what hopefully is a short period of time of hurt now, can be experienced in a slightly better way for people in our community. It's always easy to say that things are going well, but the reality is right now we've got the lowest GSP per capita, the lowest productivity, the lowest workforce participa participation rate and the highest proportion of the population receiving income support payments right now. There's no doubt that one of the best ways to provide a framework for your future is through education. And I wanted to um, acknowledge some of the capital projects that are included in the budget. But again, uh, where there have been projects that have been committed previously and have not been delivered within a term or within a time frame, when you raise expectations in a community and you make an announcement, you set an expectation that there will be change, that something good is coming and something different will occur. And so one of my roles over the balance of this term will to be ensure that there's oversight on the progress of and the delivery of commitments such as the major redevelopment at Exeter High School or the upgrades to the Glenju swimming pool, which from memory, um, constant lobbying from uh, this side of the house brought to the attention of the government the need to actually deliver on that. Many young people uh, from northern Tasmania learn to swim and develop their uh, water safety through the Glendrew swimming pool. I want to acknowledge the final funds that are being delivered to um, finish the kindergarten at East Launceston Primary School, the new school that's going to be delivered at Lagana. Uh, 
and also the Child and Family Learning Centre delivered into the East Tamar. While those things are positive and there's an expectation set now that things will be delivered in the community, um, some announcements that have been made which give me the concern about things, whether they'll be followed up, um, they've been referred to as signature policy announcements around the health services in Launceston, particularly at the LGH. Now, I understand that there was a, uh, an explanation of this given this morning. However, when you raise expectation in the community that the stage two of the master plan would be delivered, but there's not one dollar in the budget which is what we're talking about now, uh, identified in order to progress that. It raises expectations. It, it, I had an email from a family, a friend, uh, just over the weekend where their elderly father around 80 years of age, had to call an ambulance for a critical moment and arrived at the Launceston General Hospital, ramped in an ambulance for hours. Older members of our, any member of our community, but particularly older members of our community who need support to be continued to have these experiences. And then we have these big announcements and people think there'll be change, but this change isn't for a long way into the future. Um, I just think we need to be really careful about how we um, raise expectations in the community, not only for the stage two, um, um, developments of the master plan, but there was a lot to be said about the co-location of the private hospital uh, with Calvary in Launceston. Uh, there's a lot said about the size and scale of that as well. Uh, however, I understand that there may have been an MOU signed, but people are looking for outcomes for the health in Launceston. Uh, traffic infrastructure gets a lot of conversation in the south, and I know that congestion in the south is critical, but equally in the north, unless action is taken to ease uh, traffic concerns for members of both the East and the West Tamar in the Tamar Valley, then this too will get to a point where it's out of control. There's been much said about the new Tamar River Bridge. Uh, there has been much announced about the Tamar Valley Transport Traffic Vision. Uh, and it's been suggested that the feasibility work does show that it is constructible, viable, uh, and can be delivered. Uh, the announcement said uh, with construction being completed by 2028. But it does say that uh, this will make great improvements to the travel times and safety on the West Tamer Highway, removing the traffic from key West Tamer activity centres. But you go across the bridge and then what? Uh, for a lot of the announcements that are happening, it's all very well and good to make an announcement, make people feel comfortable and confident about uh, what is being announced. But then what are the next steps and where is the true solution to some of the issues that are being identified? A bit like uh, the commitment that's been made to the Kanamaluka Tamer River Estuary. There's been a lot said about uh, the catchment management needs of this area and then focusing in on small areas like uh, the, the area identified in the current Kanamaluka Tamer River Estuary vision. Uh, and the government uh, in the election seemed to believe that by committing a small amount of funds, and really, it, although it's a large number for many, beyond comprehension, $4 million, a small amount of funds towards um, an issue that needs far greater investment may allow people in the community to feel like this is a solution and it's a solve. The reality is, and there was a letter, in fact, just today in the examiner um, from a Mr Ken Terry saying that, in fact, he would likely... Uh, expect that the $4 million may not even cover the bureaucratic paperwork and the planning, getting the approvals, uh, let alone actually having any dredging occur. So again, raising expectations in the community of solutions without actually being able to deliver a complete outcome, I think is really disappointing for our community. Um, I was explaining it to a younger person recently and said, you know, dredging in the river is sort of like playing at the beach. You, you draw a canal to your sandcastle and a wave comes in and it's gone again. These targeted dredging uh, to provide recreational access in the Tamer River estuary for $4 million, $2 million a year over two years, and then what? Um, these are the concerns that I have about a lot of the commitments that are being made in the, in the budget right now. The other concern I suppose I have is, and again, it's because of my experience, particularly over the last couple of weeks which I have found disappointing, is that it's 
it seems easy to say one thing or to make a mistake on saying something and then not having to correct it or not having to stand up to it. And and um, there's there's always a response for everything. So someone may bring forward a fact and then someone um, responds in a really random and different way. You ask a question and then the answer doesn't sort of match up to the intention of the question. But I don't think you can hide from the fact uh, that at the moment our 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 financial position is challenged. I don't think you can take away from that. We had the uh, the fiscal we had the fiscal sustainability report released, which indicated that from our own treasury. And it's a little bit like a house of cards, like a house of credit cards, where you know there are many people that we will know personally that have had this uh, difficult and confronting situation where they may not be able to make their current needs, so they lay out their you know operational money, so their their weekly groceries or their fuel onto a credit card, and then once that gets maxed out, they get another credit card to try and pay off the payments on that credit card, and then they might find themselves spiralling into debt, just trying to keep up with the basics, not actually with making any improvements in their life. And that's how I feel at the moment about the state's budget, that it's a sort of a house of credit cards, that one thing goes wrong uh, and one thing actually puts extra weight onto this state right now, which we know in the um, uncertain times of COVID is possible, that it could all just come crumbling down. So for me, I think we need to be honest about that. And as I said at the beginning, being, being brave or courageous about the way we talk about the reality of our circumstances would actually be welcomed because then we can join together to find solutions to those problems. Of course, people say, oh, you talk about debt and you think that that's a negative thing, but actually debt can be positive. We all know debt can be positive. We all know we can leverage funds in a really positive and productive way, but like in a personal household where you're actually paying for fuel and groceries on a credit card, it feels like that's what's happening in Tasmania right now. We built the hydro many years ago because it was a productive piece of infrastructure that will provide for the future of Tasmania. They're the sort of big, bold... Uh, projects that should be happening now because we can use money at a great price to invest in really important things to continue to be productive, but not just for the basics. Uh, there's been much said, and I completely support it, that uh, there are sectors that are doing right well now, and there is no doubt that agriculture, in my uh, folio of primary industries and water, is doing exceptionally well. And for that, we should uh, acknowledge and celebrate those people that, for generations, have been uh, incredibly intelligent and clever about the way that they have developed and grown their sectors and many of the subsectors, and they are providing that backbone for the Tasmanian economy. But unfortunately, in my folio area, which also covers uh, fisheries and aquaculture, it's not always the same story. And one of the areas where I would like to see us work together across the House, and one of the areas that I think actually Tasmanians need us to stand up together, uh, is in the area of aquaculture. And I speak to our salmon industry. I believe that, uh, and Labor are really clear about this, that we are strong and stand clearly behind the salmon industry. And I believe that on the other side of the House, we need to hear more and there needs to be more done to ensure that Tasmanians, but in fact not just Tasmanians, but our country recognises uh, the value of the salmon industry in Tasmania. The salmon industry supports thousands of Tasmanians and their communities, uh, and that's something that should be celebrated. It is no doubt that... Um, the supplies and indirect benefits it provides to Tasmania is also really important. And so where we have a world-leading industry that is under attack right now, I think we need to do more to stand up and stand up together to support that industry. Uh, uh, and again, I said that I would acknowledge things that are positive um, and I will do my best to ensure that these things come to fruition. But I do want to acknowledge uh, the government's investment with the University of Tasmania in the Tasmanian Agricultural Precinct in Newnham, in Launceston. Uh, that has been something that I remember back in 2000 as Mayor of Launceston when we said that we would be a city of education and open to the world. One of the key pillars of that at that time was try to implement an agriculture 
agricultural precinct into Launceston. And now it feels like um, it's the perfect storm and things are coming together. Uh, and that will be truly important, not only to Northern Tasmania, but all Tasmania, to bring those research facilities together. And I, I want to acknowledge that. Uh, but I want to acknowledge the challenges in the sector as well. There are challenges with seasonal workers. There is challenge with trade pressure. There's challenges with biosecurity. And I think, again, we need to stand up to those challenges and make sure that we're doing all that we can to protect the Tasmanian brand, but to protect those people that are delivering the produce, that are delivering the things that create uh, the value in that Tasmanian brand. There are lots of small contributions that have been made uh, in that folio, and I probably don't have time to acknowledge them all, but I, I want to say that to date, um, I'm willing to stand up and be a champion for all of these sectors. I know that um, the Minister has acknowledged my contribution in that already to this point, and uh, in addition to keeping to account uh, these contributions, I also want to stand up together to celebrate those things that are positive. There was a commitment for Stadiums Tasmania in the budget, um, an area of particular interest of mine and I think that um, there's no doubt that we all recognise the importance of sport, active, healthy communities and how they can be uh, economic contributors. And I do want to just point out today uh, that uh, my love of basketball and the importance of things like this infrastructure being uh, invested in brings to my attention an announcement today that we have uh, an Australian uh, moment in history being made today with Karen Nylander being appointed to the chair of the Tasmanian Jack Jumpers. Um, it's great to see a local in that role and uh, I can't wait to see that team on the court uh, and on courts in northern Tasmania. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, that brings me to one of my other folio areas in small business. We talk about, and uh, Mr Tucker, member for Lyons, just said again that small business is the engine room of the economy. And I think when I spoke uh, to one of my first questions or my first matter of importance last week, it's clear to me, and I know that Mr Tucker and others get this really importantly, but an engine doesn't work unless all the elements um, are well supported and looked after. Uh, and so, and so, in order that we can best support what is critical to Tasmania across all sectors on all scales, we need to make sure that we are listening to people in business right now. And I acknowledge there's been a shift in the um, current grants supporting smaller micro businesses, and that's been welcomed. I've had a flood of emails from people thanking us for our uh, role in that, acknowledging Labor's role in being able to support um, often young families, often people that are at, uh, making a supplementary income into their family, and that small amount that has fallen to below $50,000, which has now been acknowledged, is making all the difference in those families. But what I want to do is express concern on um, how long it takes to respond to the concerns in our community, but also how long it takes um, to understand what it takes to support our community. Uh, and just yesterday, we brought to the attention of the House the concern with the treatment of uh, payroll tax over JobKeeper payments. Um, and I, I just want to speak to that for a little bit. So where um, just this afternoon in the response to the budget, those people on the other side of the House say that we lack credibility because all we seek to do is hold the government to account. That's our job. Our job is to bring forward a voice on behalf of people that need support right now in order that things can change, that the backbone of our economy and the engine of our economy doesn't fail. So when, when we have in the budget an allocation of $300 million that can be invested into uh, support for our small businesses in Tasmania, and yet the other side of the house say, well, where, where do you think you're going to get the money from? How, why do you always want to spend more? It's not about spending more. This is about investing a dollar now so that in the future that, that dollar amount doesn't have to be uh, multiple times more to correct failure to maintain support now for jobs, for workers and for their communities. There is no doubt that although there are many that are doing well, there are more that are struggling. And that struggle is short term. It's not about long term handouts. It's about getting people from this moment where they are at risk of uh, their employees losing hours 
or losing their job and then when? And we know it will happen and, and we know it will happen because we will make a contribution but also because the cycle will turn that when the border restrictions are lifted, when people come back to Tasmania or they come into Tasmania because they recognise that it's a great place to be, that our businesses will struggle to deliver. And that's not good for Tasmania. It's not good for the businesses who have invested hours and dollars in training their staff to get to this point to lose them and have to reinvest those funds. Uh, I will say at the end of this, uh, although it's not necessarily directly a reflection on the budget, it is a reflection on financial impacts uh, and, it's, and it's something that's happening right now. But we heard in the House yesterday the Minister for Small Business um, misunderstand a policy and misrepresent what was actually happening to people in the community right now. Uh, today in the House, say something different, but not correct the record in order that people that are filling in their annual returns right now and being lobbed with unexpected payroll tax liabilities don't know what to do. And it's been suggested that you ring a helpline. The calculation is there. They're now actually having to pay payroll tax when they thought they wouldn't have to pay anything. For many people, the JobKeeper payments have tipped them over the threshold and now they have unexpected liabilities. For a person that is finding it difficult right now to now come up with, say, $7,000, which was one of the examples that we were given, to pay a liability uh, that they had not accounted for, can be crippling. I mean, that can be wages, it can be future investment not being able to be delivered on, but it's unreasonable to expect our community to have to be able to manage their businesses and their cash flow when we can't get, or the other side of the house can't get, policies clear in order to provide certainty for the people that are the engine room of our economy. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, the other, uh, the other part of my folio suite, which I love that I have, uh, is, small, uh, is startups. Now, there's not much said about startups in this place, and there's not much said uh, about startups generally, and perhaps sometimes a startup is a bit misunderstood in the community. Some people might believe that a startup is a new business simply. Uh, and people are opening new businesses all the time and that's fantastic uh, and they should be commended for that. Uh, having opened new businesses from scratch myself numerous times before, I know how hard that is. Uh, a startup is a business that can scale uh, and can scale rapidly without necessarily just needing more people. Uh, but it could be a great idea, a tech idea, it could be a new innovation. It's, it's solving a problem and then being able to deliver that not only perhaps locally to solve the problem, but it might be actually from Tasmania solving an international problem. And there's a journey that a, an operator has to go on, that a startup, an entrepreneur has to go on to get from an idea to delivery, to making sure that it's actually viable, and then getting through the scaling process, which is itself is tremendously complicated, and maybe to the ultimate outcome to an exit. So I'm uh, happy to see that in the budget there are funds for enterprise that do a lot of the support at the ideation stage of startups uh, and do a lot of support to get people through those early moments and early chapters in the life of a startup. I acknowledge that uh, the funds in that area have been extended up to the northwest coast of the Cradle Coast Authority to do some support up there as well with enterprise. But what I hear repeatedly from people in this space, and it's a, it's a really niche space and a space that um, does take some understanding is, for those of you know, you know, travelling through the valley of death and being able to make sure that your product is viable and successfully scale with the investment that's required, with the, um, you know, the complex process of bringing in and attracting investors and then being able to deliver, uh, particularly from Tasmania, where you know, it is hard and expensive to compete against others that might be employing people from other parts of the world right here in Australia and Tasmania. But to get through that valley of death and then be successful, that's the part that really needs support. So I would call on um, those that have responsibility for this space to really get in and understand what it takes to get from the idea to the exit and that we seek to support the whole process in Tasmania because the benefits reaped are game-changing. The benefits reaped of of those one or two, you know, unicorns that go successful and make a massive impact, whether it be locally or globally, will make a massive difference to the fundamental bottom line of the Tasmanian economy. So that's an area that I'm really excited to be a part of and to support um, and believe that as a Tasmanian community we could do better at really understanding and understanding that culture of giving something a go and failing and giving something a go and failing and giving something a go again and building that big idea that makes 
a game-changing difference not only to the world to solve a problem, but can make that game-changing difference to the economy of Tasmania. So as I wrap up now, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I just want to reconfirm my commitment to Tasmania to acknowledging things when they go well, um, but to standing up and having the courage to call out things that are not going so well. Um, I couldn't be more proud in the end of this, my first 10 weeks uh, in this place, to be part of the Labor team, uh, to have the support of the Labor community uh, and to be representing Bass to the very best of my abilities. Labor's determined to make sure that all Tasmanians get a fair go. We're determined that our economy is working across all sectors, large and small, and that we're determined that the Tasmanian economy is working for everybody and for the children who will have the future of this great place we call home.